Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you to Exeter University because the partnership we have here with Exeter is really forward thinking and is doing something that has not happened really before anywhere. That's a completely interdisciplinary centre for circular economy here with University of Exeter Business School. It's a big deal. It's a big deal in trying to understand more about the circular economy and for us as a foundation it is hugely exciting. So thank you, thank you for having me and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Now David went back through some of my story. Um, some of you may know it, some of you may not, but I just kind of want to help you to set foot in the place I was that took me from sailing, which I thought I would quite frankly be doing for the rest of my life, to creating a foundation with the goal to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. You know, from the age of four, I was a girl who somehow wanted to sail around the world. I had absolutely no idea how I would make that happen. I grew up in Derbyshire. Um, the sea wasn't particularly close, and I didn't have a sailing family. But I sailed, I completely fell in love with the freedom that you feel on a boat, this feeling that this little boat can take you anywhere in the world. It was everything to me. And so I read everything I could on sailing. I saved my school dinner money change for eight years, having mashed potato and baked beans every single day with free gravy so that I could make little piles of a pound, drop them in a money box, and finally get to 100 pounds and buy a tiny little boat to sit in the garden in. That was my journey, but it was all I could do to get one step, step closer to sailing around the world. I had no idea how I'd get there, but I knew where I was going. And so imagine how it felt five years after leaving school to be sitting in a design meeting with a yacht designer who, funny enough, lives half, away from, half an hour away from here and I saw last night, designing a boat on which I would sail around the world. It was unbelievable. I couldn't believe I was living my life. It was absolutely extraordinary. And that began this incredible eight-year career of racing across the Atlantic, sailing halfway around the world in training, back across the Atlantic, around the world solo, back across the Atlantic, new boat build, half the way around, in the, around the world in training, back across the Atlantic twice, and then finally the second round the world, which was the one where I broke the solo non-stop round the world record. It was a complete conveyor belt of, of awesomeness of design, of building, of preparation, of being at sea, of living in this different world. It was absolutely phenomenal. I loved every single second of it, which is why when I stand here and talk about it, I cannot believe I walked away. But when you do that, when you prepare for journeys like that, particularly around the world, you prepare in a certain way. You take everything that you need for your survival and you put it on that boat, but you have to have the minimum. And that's medical equipment, it's diesel for the generator, it's food, it's fuel, it's clothing, the minimum. Because if you don't have the minimum, the boat will be too heavy. And if the boat is too heavy, you will never win the race and you will never break the record. And so you enter this different place. You enter this different mode of thinking. You set off on that round the world. You basically race right round Antarctica via down the Atlantic, round Antarctica and back up the Atlantic. So at times in the Southern Ocean, you are two and a half thousand miles away from the nearest town and the nearest people to you man the European space, sorry, the International Space Station above. So if you need help, it's five days for someone to get to you, and then five days for you to get back into a hospital, because that's how long it takes a ship to get to you from Australia, New Zealand, or South America. You are quite literally in the middle of nowhere. No plane can get anywhere near you, there's no airports, and no helicopter can fly anywhere near you because they can't carry enough fuel. You really are isolated. Now imagine being on that boat with those finite resources. Finite has a whole new meaning. What you have on that boat is all you have. There is no more. There just isn't. You can't stop, you can't buy more. You just realize that everything you have is incredibly precious and you need to leave, use it incredibly carefully and you need to keep just enough, just enough to get you to the finish line. Every seven days the food goes down, every day the fuel goes down, you have bags, you just see everything disappear. And that was my world at sea. That was what I lived, that's what I breathed. That was just entering my sea mode. Never gave it a second thought until the finish of the round the world record attempt. I suddenly realized our global economy is exactly the same. We have finite resources available to us once in the history of humanity, and yet when you look how we use them, we are using them up. And when you look at the trajectory of how fast we use those resources, it's a hockey stick, it goes up and up and up. And yet we have a growing world population and we have not been able to reverse that line. We are using up something that is finite. And what struck me kind of deep inside was A, something I didn't want to feel because I was doing my dream job of racing around the world, but B, something that wasn't right. It didn't sit right. Finite resources, growing world population, can't work. The economy as it stands cannot function in the long term if it remains linear, as we call it today. You take a material, you make something out of it, and then ultimately the majority of it, to be fair, even today, gets thrown away. 
And I talked to many experts and scientists trying to understand, you know, so what is this in parallel with sailing? Visited coal-fired power stations, sat on global CR councils, trying to work out, you know, what is the future? And so much of the strategy that people were discussing was, let's eke things out a bit longer. Let's use a little bit less. Let's make a car with a bit less material in it. Let's make it lighter. Let's use a little bit less energy, which is really important in the, in the transition because we have finite materials and we don't want to use them up even faster. But in the transition to what? What can actually work for our global economy? What's the goal? Is the goal to buy ourselves time or is the goal to actually build a restorative, regenerative economy that can work? And it was there that I dug deeper and I pushed harder because I, just buying time wasn't enough. It had to be a journey. It had to be a journey of understanding. Where are we really trying to get to? What's that goal? For me as a four-year-old kid, it was sailing around the world. For our global economy, what is it? And it was through digging deeper that I started to come across other thinkings. People's work around circular economy, sorry, around Cradle to cradle design, around industrial ecology, around performance economy, sharing economy, all these different schools of thought. And one particular person who I met on that journey who had begun to synthesize these different ways of thinking. And he actually came from education. He's actually sitting right here. Ken Webster, already been mentioned. And what Ken had done is he looked at the big picture and he'd synthesized what's out there. And he had seen a circle instead of a line. And actually, that's the first thing I saw, was a drawing in some of Ken's educational material which showed a line and a circle. So simple. There's a very big difference. One falls off the edge of the cliff. The other can go round and round forever. And that's what we set out with when we launched the Alan MacArthur Foundation in September 2010, was this basic fundamental idea that perhaps you could shift the global economy from one which is extractive and consumptive, take, make, dispose, to one which, by design, by intent, not only cycles materials, which is the obvious part, but keeps products at their highest use. So when you've made something, it has more value as that product than the raw materials within it. That changes the business model that enables people to have access to that product. You have products that are metal, plastics, in the technical sphere, and then you have products which are biological, like cotton or timber or food waste, human waste, anything that biodegrades. What if they all go round in a circle? And actually, when you look at life itself, it's done that for billions of years, really quite successfully. Life itself has never created waste. So when you look at a circular economy, you design out waste and pollution, because in a finite world, with a growing world population, why would we ever design waste? It seems a real waste to design waste, because it just gets thrown away. We have no way. Design out waste. Keep products and materials in use for as long as possible, because that's where so much of the value lies. And then the third element is regenerate natural systems. We hear about trying to keep our topsoil a little bit longer, trying to keep it fertile a little bit longer, but actually, if you can recover all biological material, you know, human waste, farm waste, food production waste, food waste itself, and feed that back onto farms, get that back into the soil, you're regenerating natural capital. You're not just making it last a bit longer. This is about being restorative and regenerative. It's a completely different way of thinking. And so we launched the foundation in 2010 with that goal of accelerating the transition to a circular economy. But one of the first things that we did was we went to McKinsey. We went to what we believed was the best management consultant in the world because we felt if they thought this was a good idea, probably quite a lot of other people might as well. It was brand new. We turned up with a two-pager and we had a meeting with McKinsey where we discussed <coughs> circular economy. Now, McKinsey had done a huge amount of work on resource efficiency, but what we were talking about was more kind of resource effectiveness. It was a challenging meeting. To their credit, three months later, they picked up the phone, they rang us up and they said, right, we've run the numbers and we want to talk about this more. And that led to the production of our first report, which we launched in January 2012 at the World Economic Forum. And it showed a 630 billion US dollar economic opportunity if we switch from linear to circular. And that figure came from European numbers, this wasn't a global figure, and from goods that cycle in more than one year and less than 10. So only a relatively small sector of the global economy. It was huge. And when you walk into Davos with a 630 billion US dollar economic opportunity, people listen. We were saying, Linear versus circular, circular wins. There's more money to be made through circular than linear. You can decouple growth from resource constraints. You can be more profitable for business, and it's better for the wider economy because there's employment there, there's growth there. You're decoupling growth from resource constraints. We then went on to produce more reports. We broadened our work with businesses, cities, regions, and governments through the CE100. And our education work that we started off with right at the beginning in September 2010 as something that's grown. It's become more international, and the pioneer status of Exeter University with the foundation is absolutely a part of that. 
We work now with over 100 universities all over the world through fellowship programs, through developing teaching and learning in circular economy, and through research. So this is really something that's gaining momentum, and, and not just with businesses, not just with universities, but also we've had a six-year journey with the European Commission. They now have their second circular economy package and are looking at the third. They have legislation around circular economy because it just makes sense. They see this as growth and competitiveness for Europe. The circular economy underpins that. This is not about recycling a bit and looking at the waste directive. It's about shifting the way Europe functions so it can, be much, so it can use resources in a much more intelligent way, so it can redesign systems. And there's a very interesting report we did called The Growth Within, looking at exactly that. Europe, built environment, mobility and food systems. And how the internet revolution, if you like, and the IT revolution, the enablement of us to access everything through our smartphones, how that can unlock circular activity within Europe. So we've dug into so many pockets of what circular economy is and what circular economy looks like. It's been an absolutely fascinating journey. We probably know 1% of what the circular economy is globally. And as I talked with Peter, I'd really enjoy just going through some of the work that we've done, digging more into circular economy, hearing some of your questions. And some of the initiatives that we're running now, which we call systemic initiatives, have been such a steep learning curve for us. Physically taking a material flow and trying to make it become circular globally. Seemed impossible when we first discussed it, but some of those are really on track to make some significant progress. So these are exciting times. Um, I shall sit down with Peter and we're going to have a chat now and then I'm going to answer your questions. But uh, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak.